Hello, Stu from Music Technology, and in this video, I thought we'd revisit our simple op amp booster circuit or clean boost circuit as we've built in past videos. And we'd approach it as if we were going to turn this into a commercial product. Now, this works effectively, but if you were going to design this as a commercial product, there's things you might want to put into this in terms of filtering a more stable power supply. So, we're going to turn this circuit into this. Now this initially might look a bit more complex on paper, but I'm going to talk through each of these sections and explain what they do. And then later on, we'll compare the original circuit here on the breadboard to the new circuit, which is here on the breadboard. So if that sounds interesting, stick with me and we'll explore this throughout the video. Now, before we continue looking at this circuit in depth, let's just talk through some improvements we can make to this circuit here. So first of all, I used the 741 op amp. It's right there. But it was probably better to use something like an 061 or an 071 or one side of an 072, if that's what you've got available. We can use filters to filter out any frequencies that we don't want, such as radio frequencies or very low noise frequencies. We could modify the voltage divider and use a bias resistor instead of just using our voltage divider straight across our incoming signal. We can bypass our voltage rails using capacitors to keep the supply nice and stable. We can add a pull down resistor on the input so when we switch the pedal from bypass to engage and back again, our input capacitor has a path to discharge through and this reduces popping when you're switching your pedal in and out. And then finally, we can add diode polarity protection. So if somebody plugs in a power supply the wrong way around or a battery the wrong way around, it protects our circuit until that is sorted out. So now let's have a look at each section of the circuit in turn. And we're going to start off by discussing op amp choice in this circuit. Before we continue and look at the various stages of the circuit in depth, Let's first of all talk about the choice of op amp in the circuit. Now, initially, I used a 741 in the initial circuit, but you can use an 061 or an 071, and it's a better choice for this circuit. Now, all of those have the same pin out, so we can just straight swap them into the circuit. Now, I have used the data sheets here to find out different aspects about these particular op amps. So first of all, I want to know whether they'll work in my 0 to 9 volts range, and indeed all of them will. If you're wondering why 741 has a couple of voltage ranges, it's because there's different versions of it available, so watch out for that when you're using data sheets. More interestingly is the input resistance, or we can also call it impedance in this case. So the 741 has a high input impedance of 2 mega ohms, but it's nowhere near as high as the 061 or the 071, because these have a junction field effect transistor input. So they both have a one tera ohm input impedance. That's a million million ohms. Sometimes you see it written as 10 to the 6 mega ohms, which means a mega mega ohm, basically. Now, also, we want a low impedance, and indeed, the 741 has the lowest impedance at 75 ohms. But the 061 and the 071 have 100 and 125 respectively, which is perfectly fine for our use. So I've swapped out my 741 for an 071, which I had in the stash of op amps. Now we're going to look at this circuit in more detail here, and we're going to break it down into sections. But just looking at the whole circuit here, I just want to point out that there's different filters here. There's a filter here, there's one here, there's one here. Here, there's one there, and there's another one there in our blocking capacitor. So this is full of RC filters, R being a resistor and C being a capacitor. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start at the power section and we're going to break this down step at a time and see what these different elements do to improve our circuit. Now, in order to fully understand what's going on in this new version of the circuit, we need to understand resistor, capacitor, or RC filters. And this is the fundamental building block of guitar pedals. So having a good understanding of this and how these different components and resistors over here and various different types of capacitors here react to 
direct current and alternating current will help you in designing your own guitar circuits in the future. Now in this video, because we're talking about an op-amp, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but I may well do a video in the future where I go into just RC filters. Now looking at these things, we have in our circuit two DC rails of 9 volts and 4.5 volts, and we call those direct current, but they're not really delivering any current because our op-amp isn't really drawing any. And then we have our alternating current signal, which is alternating in voltage, of course, and it's a few hundred millivolts peak to peak from most guitars. So resistors resist DC voltages, and they actually warm up very slightly in order to do that. That's how they dissipate the energy. However, under normal operation, you won't feel that happening. And we see those usually as a value R, so you might see 100 R, which means 100 ohms. They also impede the flow of alternating current. We say they have impedance to AC. Now, in a purely resistive circuit, which indeed would just be a resistor, that is a resistive circuit, Z, which is the symbol for impedance, is roughly equal to R. In fact, it is equal to R in a resistive circuit. It's only when we get a circuit that's not entirely resistive, such as a speaker, which has an inductor in it, which moves the speaker back and forth, that you'll see this says 4 ohms impedance. But if we were to measure that in resistance, it wouldn't be 4 ohms. So in order to show this, let me just go on to ohms on my multimeter and I will measure this 4 ohm speaker terminals. And you can see it says about 4.9 ohms because that's its resistance rather than its impedance, but its impedance is 4 ohms. And luckily, in our circuit, most of our resistances are equivalent to impedances because we have a largely resistive circuit. We don't have any inductors in there, for example, apart from our guitar pickups, but I'm not including them in this circuit. Now, moving on to capacitors, and there's various types here. We've got poly box capacitors, we've got ceramic capacitors, we've got electrolytic capacitors, and we've got polypropylene capacitors. And there's a lot of discussion as to which type of capacitors best for which operation. These also aren't all the different types of capacitors. You can have ones like tantalum, you can have multi layer ceramic capacitors, there's all sorts. Now, when it comes to DC, they hold charge, and we're going to look at a demonstration of that in a moment. Before we look at how capacitors react to alternating currents, let's remind ourselves of what happens when we put a DC current through them. So here I've got a simple circuit, it's an LED and a current limiting resistor. And then across this circuit, parallel with it, I have got a capacitor, positive end is here, negative end is here, and this is a thousand microfarads. Across the capacitor, these crocodile clips are connected directly to my DC voltmeter. So I'm going to take my 9 volt battery, direct current, and I'm going to apply it to the LED and it lights up. Now, ordinarily, when I disconnect this, it would go out instantly, but it's not doing that. If you look at the voltmeter, you can see the voltage is dropping over time as the capacitor is discharging through the LED and through this resistor to ground. That's going to continue dropping, and now we don't have enough forward voltage to light up the LED anymore, but we still have 1.5 volts on this capacitor. So now, let me discharge the capacitor by shorting it out. Now I'm going to do is disconnect the ground entirely, so it's only connected to the battery, and I'm going to put 9.13 volts on this capacitor. Now let me just disconnect everything. Okay. 
and you'll see that this is holding that voltage fairly well. It's ebbing away over time, but it will slow down. This is why in high voltage circuits, you need to discharge these capacitors to safely work on them because they will hold the voltage you apply to them. Now I've only got nine volts, so I can use a little wire like this to short it out. And that is immediately going to discharge it. Now, if you're wondering why it's going up again now, that's to do with the dielectric effect, but that's beyond the scope of this particular video. We might come back to that in the future. When it comes to AC, they react to AC, have reactants. And you can simplistically think about that at the moment as a frequency dependent resistance. So the resistance changes based on frequency. And actually what happens is they let high frequencies through. And the way that I remember that is capacitors block DC. And if you imagine DC is very similar to an AC signal with no hertz, zero hertz, so it's not fluctuating, so it's direct, we know the capacitor will block that. And therefore it will also block low frequencies because they're close to DC. It's a spectrum rather than DC or AC. So we go from no fluctuation right up to rapid quick fluctuation when we're talking about technologies that use microwaves and things like that. Now, fortunately, we're only interested in the guitar spectrum of frequencies here. We want to block out the other frequencies so we can put these into operation as high and low pass filters. And we do that by combining a resistor and a capacitor. So if we look over here, we've got a high pass RC filter. This capacitor is laying high frequencies through here and we've got some impedance to ground. Now, because there's an impedance to ground here, that's going to affect the charge and discharge time of this capacitor as we go from positive over here and negative over here to positive over here and negative over here, and we're switching between the two. So the calculation to calculate where the cutoff frequency is involves both of these things. And if we swap the positions of them, simply swap them around, so the resistor is now in series with our incoming signal and the capacitor is in parallel to our incoming signal, we then reverse the operation because as you can see now, the high frequencies are being let through to ground. And again, we've got this resistor which helps control the timing of the capacitor. Now there's some maths involved in working out the cutoff frequency, sometimes also called the corner frequency. Fc, which stands for cutoff frequency, equals one, so the inverse of two pi times the resistor times the capacitor. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at an example now and then we're going to move over onto the breadboard and see that in operation. Okay, so initially I've just plugged in a capacitor, 100 nanofarads, across the input going to the output and then I've just connected my grounds together. No resistor at this point. So this is just purely what a capacitor does to an AC signal. Now, if you're thinking about where's the battery stew, there's no battery, this is a passive filter, so it doesn't need a battery, that would be an active filter. So I'm just literally running the signal through the capacitor and out. Now I'm at about 10 hertz, and you can see there's barely any change between the blue and the yellow waveform here, which means the input is very similar to the output. Now what happens when I drop the frequency? See them starting to separate there around 3 hertz. And they become much more separated when we get all the way down to 1.4 hertz. That's a very low frequency. We're getting towards DC here. Now let me swap that out with another capacitor that I've just got lying around here. This is a 332, so that's 3300 or 3,300 picofarads, 3.3 nanofarads. So it's smaller than our 100 nanofarad. I'll pop that out and I'll pop this one in, in its place. Now have a look at the attenuation now. It's much more significant because I'm using a smaller value of capacitor. 
Let's bring the frequency up again on our function generator. We can see it's also picking up some interference due to its small value. Now even at 21 hertz so far, it's not up to the input signal. So let's jump up a scale. We can see it kind of is there at 220 hertz. So I'm just going to bring that down and have a look at where that starts to attenuate. It's around here, 150 hertz. You can see that getting significantly smaller. And you can see the interference is picking up. That might be from the phone I'm filming on. So by reducing the capacitance value of our filter, we change the value that the capacitor kicks in at. Now, when we actually do these things, in order to stabilize this and to have more control over how it filters, we can control its relationship to ground or its relationship to the signal using a resistor to form an RC filter. And we'll have a look at that next. Let's have a look at an example of a low pass filter using a one kilo ohm resistor and a 100 nanofarad capacitor. Now this is called a first order filter. And the cutoff frequency is given by this formula and we're gonna use that to work it out in a second. Now the cutoff frequency is where the signal has been attenuated by roughly three decibels. So it isn't here, it's where we've got three decibels of attenuation from our unity gain level here. And I've drawn that on a graph with 20 hertz being at this end and 20 kilohertz being at this end because this is the frequency spectrum we can hear within. I'm not gonna go into why it's three decibels in this video, but when we do an RC filter video in the future, I will explain why that is when we look at phase angles. Now you'll see, because it's a first order filter, we have a gradual slope here. And the slope is minus six decibels per octave, that's how much it attenuates by, which is also minus 20 decibels per decade, but it's better to think of it in octaves when we're talking about audio. So minus six decibels per octave is a first order filter. So let's do some maths here. So I've used K and N here. So what I've done is just converted these into full numbers to make the equation easier. So one kilo ohm is a thousand ohms and 100 nanofarads is the same as 0.1 microfarads or 0.0000001 farad. So let's turn on our calculator. And on this calculator, we can do the whole calculation at once. So I would do one divided by, and I'm actually just going to use brackets to make it clearer what I'm doing here. Two, find the pi symbol, it's there multiplied by a thousand multiplied by naught point naught 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 one close brackets equals so we've got approximately 1591 hertz or cycles per second with this 0.549431 or 0.53 here could be rounded up to 0.55 actually the reason it doesn't matter that much is because, of course, components have tolerances. So if we're using a metal film resistor, it might have a tolerance of 1%, say. And capacitors have tolerances too. So this isn't going to be exactly 1K, and this isn't going to be exactly 100 nanofarads. And these are also affected by environmental factors as well. So saying this is approximately 1.6 kilohertz is completely fine, or 1,600 hertz, if you will. And I've plotted that on the graph there. So you can see what's happening. All the signals getting through this side, the pass band. And then this side is getting attenuated by minus six decibels per octave. This is called the stop band. Now, this equation is also the same for the high pass version of this filter, which I've drawn down here, which is simply swapping the components over the other way around. So 100 nanofarads here and one kilo ohm here. Just look at the difference between these two seconds. So you recognize them, high pass, low pass. And then this graph would look like this with our 1.6 kilohertz being at minus three decibels again, roughly here. But this time it's passing 
a high frequency, so this is a pass band, and this is the stop band, they flipped. Position. So now, let's go into the breadboard and have a look at these two examples. Okay, so I'm feeding my function generator here, and you can see it's on 162, 165.2 uh, hertz. It's feeding into a low pass filter, and I'm monitoring the input and the output on the oscilloscope. It just looks like one waveform at the moment because the input is equal to the output. You may be able to just about see a difference between the blue and yellow lines there. I'm going to increase the frequency here and watch what happens to the blue and the yellow. The blue is the output as I increase the frequency towards our corner frequency of 1.6 kilohertz as we calculated before. See, so it starts to drop. And then around there, it will be a three decibel drop. If I zoom in on the oscilloscope, you see that a bit better. You can also see the phase between these things has changed as well. I won't be discussing why that is in this particular video or well in the future. And if we jump up a whole frequency spectrum, you can see that that blue waveform is significantly reduced compared to the input. Note that they're both on 200 millivolts peak to peak here, so it's a fair comparison. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to swap these components around the other way so you can see that the opposite is true and we create a high pass filter instead. So I swap those components around the other way now and I'm at 1.6 kilohertz and this will be where well, there's about a three decibel difference again between the two signals but this time if I go up in frequency and watch this frequency you'll see it has the opposite operation and those signals are starting to get closer together whereas if I go down in frequency they will get further apart like that and if I drop down a whole scale and adjust the oscilloscope, you'll see that there's now significant attenuation, but in the other direction, 165 hertz is what I'm on at the moment. So hopefully that's given you a demonstration of how these things can be set up in low pass mode and high pass mode. Now imagine if we use these together, what do you think happens? Well, we either get a band pass filter, which will have a response that looks like this, or we get a notch filter that looks like this, based on which way around we set these up. Now let's go and have a look at our circuit and the different aspects of it and see how this idea is employed throughout the circuit. So let's have a look at the power section of our circuit. So in our previous circuit, we've got a 9 volt battery here connected between the positive rail and ground, and we're dividing that voltage in half using these two 2M2 resistors here, R bias 1 and R bias 2. I've called them that because we're providing a 4.5 bias voltage, which we're then superimposing our guitar input signal onto, and it's feeding into the non-inverting input. Now we can do slightly better than this. We can filter the power supply so if we get any slight dropouts or variation in power supply or any unwanted noise, it's still stable and powering our op amp effectively. And we can also protect our circuit in case that the power is plugged in in reverse. So this is plus and this is minus. We don't want it to ruin our circuit. So let's have a look at that on the diagram. So here on the diagram, we've got a battery again connected between the plus voltage rail and the ground, which all of these things are common to. Now, first of all, it goes through a 100 ohm resistor. And the reason for that is it's forming a filter with these capacitors. And these capacitors are in parallel. And capacitors in parallel add up their capacitances unlike resistors. So they're like putting resistors in series, basically. So capacitors in parallel are added together. So the total capacitance is this plus this. And if you take a minute to think about what filter this is, going through a 100 ohm resistor first and then through these capacitors. So 
it's a low pass filter, that's correct. Now we could redraw that, of course, we could say 100R and we can have a capacitor here, which is C total equals 47 microfarads plus 47 nanofarads. Now a micro is a millionth. A nanofarad is a thousand millionth or a billionth. So this is quite interesting now and we might want to use scientific notation to make it easier and help us out when we're doing calculations. So we can say 47 microfarads is 47 times 10 to the minus 6. And we can say 47 nanofarads is 47 times 10 to the minus 9. Now ideally, in proper scientific notation, we want to say 4.7 times 10 to the minus 7 and 4.7 times 10 to the minus 10. But just to keep it easier for this video, let's do it this way and put it into our calculator this way. So we've got 47, and I'm going to use this button here, times 10 to the minus 6 plus 47 times 10 to the minus 9 equals See now how it's converted into 4.7, just as I said ideally these would be 4.7. So we've got 4.7047, which is what we expect because of that capacitor and that capacitor being added together, times 10 to the minus 5. So we'll just keep this like this for a second and then we'll use our equation, shall we? So what's our equation? Cutoff frequency equals 1 over 2 pi. Now, probably at this stage, you're wondering, why is it 2 pi, Stu? Well, the reason for that is because we're converting it into degrees. We talk about phase angle in degrees, don't we? And this calculation uses radians, and we need to convert radians into degrees. Now, very quickly, we know there's 360 degrees in a circle, but there's also 2 pi radians. So we're just using this to convert it. And again, when I talk about filters in more depth in a future video, I'll talk more about why that is. Okay, so we've got 100 ohms, and then we've got 4.7 Point seven zero four seven times 10 to the minus 5. Now because I've got that on my screen already, I could just do this backwards. Times 100 times 2 pi equals... Now I need to take 1 and divide it by the answer. Now what I can do on the calculator is use this button here, which is to the minus 1, which is exactly the same as saying 1 over something. So if I do x to the minus 1, that gives me my answer of cutoff frequency is approximately 33.8 hertz. And what type of filter is this? It's a low pass filter. So it's only going to let frequencies under 33.8 hertz pass. And that's great. It's going to filter out low noise here. But why are we using a smaller value of capacitor and a higher value of capacitor here? Well, as we saw earlier on the oscilloscope, changing the capacitance value changes the way it reacts to frequencies. So by using two together to bypass the voltage rail, even though you're creating this filter altogether here, this one is able to react faster to fluctuating signals, so you get a more effective filtering of your power. Now this one isn't always used, sometimes you'll just see this one used, and indeed that's what we've got here on our 4.5 volt power rail. So power filtering, these are known as bypass or decoupling capacitors, 
not to be confused with the AC coupling capacitors on the input and output of the circuit, which I'm sure I have mislabeled decoupling capacitors in the past. But these are actually decoupling capacitors, they're decoupling or bypassing our power rails. Okay, so now let's talk about what this diode's doing here. This is a 1N4001, and it looks like this. It's one of these diodes. Uh, it's in our circuit here, and it's serving a particular function. So imagine if our battery is plugged in the right way around here. What's going to happen is energy is going to come out of here and it's going to be blocked this way. And I'm using conventional current here, of course. So this is going to go through the 100R into the circuit and our circuit is going to work. But what happens if we plug in our power source or our battery the wrong way around? So now look at what's going to happen. The energy is going to come out of here and find this short circuit back into this resistor, back into the battery. So it's literally just going to go around this loop like this until we plug the battery in or the power supply in the right way around. Now that's important because, as we know, pedals with barrel connectors anyway are center negative and most adapters in the world are center positive. So often people will just find an adapter and ram it in the pedal and see if it works. And often it doesn't work because it's the wrong polarity. Now just think about what's protecting your circuit when they do that, because it happens all the time. And the answer in my case is this diode. And I will caveat this by saying there's other ways of doing this. And there is arguments around the best way of actually protecting your circuit using diodes, MOSFETs and all sorts of other things. But for now, we're going to use a diode. So I very quickly built this up on the breadboard here. Here's a 100 ohm resistor and our diode here. And I've just used an LED with a current limiting resistor here just to show how this works. So I connect my battery the right way around and the LED lights up, as you can see. But I connect my battery the wrong way around and the LED doesn't light up because the energy is now flowing through this diode. Now, interestingly, if I switch it back around the other way, you'll see that it lights up again. And that diode is completely fine as well. Let me show you. I'll just take it out of the circuit, put it to one side, and I'll bring in my component tester here. If you're building pedals, this is a great little gadget to have, by the way, it doesn't cost very much. There we go, forward voltage, 658 millivolts, or 0.66 volts, roughly. So this die is completely fine and can handle that. Now, moving on, we've got a voltage divider here, but instead of using 2.2 mega ohm resistors, I'm using 200K resistors, which you'll see a lot in guitar pedals that use op amps. You'll also see 47K as another value for these. I've opted for 100K here. Again, this one microfarad capacitor is helping keep this voltage stable coming out here and feeding it to our up amp. Now, because these are 100K, that's going to have the voltage. So we're going to get 4.5 volts here. But we can draw a bit more current if we need to. Now, in this circuit, we don't need to because we're feeding into an op amp with one tera ohm input impedance. So that's not going to draw hardly any current at all but it's worth bearing that in mind when you're designing circuits. So this then gets fed through our bias resistor and we're using this bias resistor in combination with our pull down resistor to set our impedance. And then if you're wondering what this long line is here, this is your nine volt power rail. So we've got bias and nine volts. So hopefully that shows you some improvements we can make to the power supply for our pedal. Now let's have a look at the input part of our circuit. We've got guitar signal coming in here. It's going through a DC blocking capacitor through this one kilo ohm resistor and into our non-inverting input of our op amp. But we've also got these resistors here, like our bias resistor, pull down resistor, and we've got another capacitor here going to ground. So first of all, this bias resistor in conjunction with this pull down resistor, and I've chosen 2M2, purposefully because they were in our original circuit so I've repurposed them here in this circuit 
These, to a large extent, set the input impedance, and we can calculate input impedance in a moment. Now, you may notice that the guitar signal is also going through two filters. There's one filter formed here by this capacitor and this resistor to AC ground. Hold on, Stu, that's not going to ground, that's going to 4.5 volts. You are correct, 4.5 volts DC. Remember, our AC signal doesn't see this 4.5 volts DC in the same way that our resistors didn't see this 9 volts DC before. Therefore, we can treat this as AC ground, which means that this is also going to ground. So here we have a 10 nanofarad and a 2.2 mega ohm filter. What type of filter is that with the capacitor first? It's a high pass filter. Now, if we move over here, you'll see we've got a resistor first and a capacitor to ground. And this is a low pass filter because the high frequencies are getting taken to ground. Now this here, we can calculate its frequency response. So let's do that first. So we know that the cutoff frequency is one divided by two pi RC, or two times pi times R times C. So the cutoff frequency of this filter is one over two pi times 2.2 times 10 to the 6, because it's six zeros, times 10 nanofarads, 10 times 10 to the minus 9, minus 9 is nanofarads, a billionth of a farad. And then we can bring our calculator in and do that exact equation. So 1 divided by, and again I'm going to use brackets to make it clear what I'm doing here, 2, and I'm really learning where that pi is, times 2.2, times 10 to the 6, times 10, times 10 to the minus 9, close brackets, equals 7.234 hertz. So approximately equal to 7.2-ish hertz. Now what type of filter is it? A high pass filter. So that means it's going to filter out any frequencies that are below that. So here we're just filtering out really low noise that might get on our signal, and we're also blocking DC. Now here we want to filter out radio frequencies. So the calculation of this, you may already realize by this being a 1N and this being a 1K, it's going to give us a much, much higher value. So let's calculate that. The cutoff frequency of that is the same equation, 2 pi RC equals 1 over 2 times pi times r, 1 times 10 to the 3, we can write that, multiplied by 1 times 10 to the minus 9, still nanofarads. And let's put that in our calculator, and I'll start again, 1 divided by 2 pi times Let's do it how I wrote it on the paper. 1 times 10 to the 3 times 1 times 10 to the minus 9, the close brackets, equals 159,000 kilohertz. So I said it was a lot higher, and it was. So let's say 160 kilohertz, roughly. So that's filtering out radio frequencies, basically, from getting onto our signal. So if you're in an area with a lot of radio frequencies, this filters them out. Now, as I said, this is then going into our RP amp. And if I draw that in here a second, non-inverting input. And we know this has a 1 tera ohm input impedance. Now, let's have a think about this. This is in parallel with this, and we know our parallel symbol is this, and then that is in parallel with one kilo ohm plus 
the one tera ohm. Because if you look at these, these are both going to ground, but this is passing through, so that's why it's plus. And again, this reference is ground, of course, so it's exactly like having this to ground. Now, if we do that calculation, what we get is approximately 1m1. Now, if you don't know how to do the parallel calculation, the original op-amp video goes into how you perform that. I won't do it again here because this video will become extremely long if I do. What I wanted to show though is because this is one tera ohm and this is only one kilo ohm, this has little significance to the input. Now, if you look at a pedal such as the MXR microamp, you'll see that this is 22 mega ohms and this is 20 mega ohms. Have a think about why they might have made those another order larger than I've got here. Now, if you said it's because they wanted to raise the input impedance, you'd be correct. And if you do that, you have a 22 mega ohm, oh, and it's actually a 10 mega ohm, sorry, not a 20 mega ohms, 22 mega ohms, 10 mega ohms then you get 6.8 mega ohm input impedance. So there was a comment before on one of my videos that asked me, can you increase the value of these resistors? And you can actually, because the op-amp doesn't draw any current. So it doesn't matter really how large these resistors are, as long as you stick within the mega ohm range, you can up it to say, 20 and 10. I don't think I've seen any higher than that, although there might be examples out there. And then you'd get a much higher impedance on your input. I have aimed for a mega ohm on my input because I wanted to redeploy these resistors from the original circuit. So we've got a filter, another filter, and we've got our input impedance set here, and we're also blocking DC. So that's the way we've improved the input part of our circuit. Now, thankfully, the next part, which involves the op amps, very similar to this part of the circuit. You can see there's the 220k there and the 100k, which sets our gain. If we have a look at the only thing I've really done to this here is added a 100 picofarad capacitor here. Now, what have we learned about capacitors so far in this video is that they let high frequencies through. And to high frequencies, they won't even see a capacitance there, it will just go straight through thus shorting out that resistor. So at high frequencies, this resistor gets shorted out. Now, if we deploy our op-amp in this configuration, this has unity gain because there's no resistance here. And what that means is if we use a capacitor to effectively do that at high frequencies, high frequencies will have unity gain and lower frequencies will be boosted. So we're changing the characteristic of our boost here because we're doing what's called shunting high frequencies. Now the high frequency response is calculated in the same way as the other calculations we've done today. And that, of course, is 1 over 2 pi times 220 times 10 to the 3. Let me write that a bit better. Times 100 times 10 to the minus 12, because it's picofarads now, so we're in minus 12. So let's do that, shall we? Lots of calculations today. So 1 divided by 2 pi times 220,000 times 100 to the minus 12, which makes it picofarads, equals, so our corner frequency is 7.5. 2-3 kilohertz, roughly. 
So any signals over 7.23 kilohertz are going to have unity gain here. So now this is beyond the top range of the guitar. We're talking about harmonics produced by the guitar here. So with a clean boost pedal, arguably it doesn't do as much as it would with an overdrive pedal with clipping diodes in here as well. So this becomes more important when you've got much more gain and you're using a clipping circuit. Now, whilst we're here, let's just remember that our voltage gain was one plus the resistor, which is a feedback resistor, RFB here, I called it R1 before, um, divided by, Sorry, this one, Ri. So one plus 220,000 plus 100 divided by even. So you remember I said you can ignore the zeros here. So we can just say 22 divided by 10. So we can say one plus in brackets 22 divided by 10 those brackets equals 16 fifths now if your calculator is set up to do fractions like mine you just need to press this s to d button here and it will give you your decimal equivalent of that 3.2 and we can press it again it goes back into fractions equals 3.2 and we know that's our voltage gain because we calculated it before but what happens at high frequencies above 7.23 kilohertz is this doesn't exist. So we get one plus Ri, and this is zero ohms. So I'm gonna put zero in there. So let's have a look at that. So let's go zero divided by 100,000 equals zero plus one, equals one, which is unity gain. So for every one you put in, you get one out, equals one. So at frequencies above this, you have unity gain. At frequencies below this, you have 3.2 gain. So as I said, it becomes particularly important when maybe you're using a 10K here instead to get a lot more gain on your clipping the op amp, which will create a square wave and harmonics, or using diodes to do the same thing, which will also create a clipped wave and therefore harmonics. And you can use this to filter out some of the harsher harmonics. Whether it's useful in a clean boost circuit is debatable, but it's good practice in case we modify the circuit in the future. So now we finally come to the output stage of our circuit. Okay, so our op amp, is connected here like this. This is the output of our op amp. And that's going into our DC blocking capacitor. It's then seeing a load of 470 ohms. Now I've done this on purpose because here we have a volume pot which is 10K and I've used a 10K linear pot here, but feel free to experiment with different A type or C types. Now have a think about what's going to happen when our output is up this end. You're not going to have any resistance. So how do we calculate the output impedance? Now we know the output impedance of our op amp is 125 ohms. I'll say 125 R there, but I mean the same thing. So 125 and again, it's in series with this one, so it's plus, not parallel, 470 equals 595 ohms. Now that is our output impedance when we don't have this part attenuating our signal. Now, what happens when we're down this end of the potentiometer? So now we have 125 ohms, 470 ohms, and 10 kilo ohms. Now we can say 125 ohms plus 470. It's a capacitor here. So this is in parallel with this, because remember that it doesn't see the DC, because it's blocking the DC. 
So 470 in parallel with 10 kilo ohms. And if you run the calculation on that, you'll find that you'll get about 574 ohms. So our output impedance range doesn't change that much. It's only changing by, what's that, 21 ohms. And I'm sorry, I keep mi mixing and matching my ohm symbol, omega and r, but you'll see both of these used in circuits. So it's probably a good idea just to get used to them being interchangeable like that. I understand it's bad practice though, so forgive me. So we've set our output impedance, and some of you may note that being an audio engineer, I'm used to seeing 600 ohms output impedance. So I've purposely used this to set an output impedance that's close to 600 ohms. Okay, so I've built both these circuits up on the breadboard here. And what I've also done is I've made a version of this with a lot of annotation on it and some corrections. And this explains all of the different calculations on the different parts of the circuit. So you can have a look at this and examine it for yourself. I'll put it in the notes for this video. So now let's move over onto the breadboard and have a listen to what these two different circuits sound like. So here we have the circuit on the breadboard and powered up with a battery, and you'll hear that it's still just clean boosting the signal. And I've added that output attenuator to it, so let's just bring that up to full. The circuit here that we've made the improvements to, which is this one, sounds more filtered because we've used more filters in it. And this one sounds brighter. Now, that doesn't mean that this one is better than this one. This one is a perfectly effective 10 decibel clean boost pedal. And so is this one. However, this one has things in it that would be used if you don't know the ultimate destination of your pedal. So once our pedal starts to go out commercially or get sent out into the world, we need to do things like designing reverse polarity protection, make sure our power rails are stable, be able to source current from our voltage divider, set our input impedance, make sure we have a pull down resistor to reduce pops, set a frequency response with filters, Decide what frequencies we want to amplify and which ones we don't, and also set an output impedance as well. Now, knowing these things and the maths that goes along with them means you can effectively design pedals. But it also means you can effectively analyse pedals that are on the market already. And if you're familiar with the MXR schematics for the microamp and the Distortion Plus, you'll see that I've heavily borrowed from those circuits in designing this one. And there's a good reason that they use these building blocks, because it mitigates some of the circumstances that might happen to it in the real world. So I would encourage you to keep looking at schematics and learning what these different sections do experiment with them on the breadboard so you can actually hear what they do to your own guitar playing. I've been Stu, this is Music Technology, happy experimenting and happy playing and I'll catch you again soon.